Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of Is the Negro a Bond Slave? A Reply Part 3 Important Notice This video is not intended to offend anyone. It is not a propaganda video. It is made in good faith for educational and reference purposes only. Please look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Remember, the Negro among the Jews, as everywhere he is found, was of a proscribed race. He was even forbidden to approach the altar to offer the bread of his God, Aral Gob, in 1858, and it's from the book An Inquiry into the Law of Negro Slavery in the United States of America, to which is prefixed an historical sketch of slavery, published 1858. And from David Walker, let no man of us budge one step and let slaveholders come to beat us from our country. America is more our country than it is the whites. We have enriched it with our blood and tears. The greatest riches in all America have arisen from our blood and tears. And while taking note of this particular quote from David Walker, let us look at a scenario. And so, imagine where two men are interested in one beautiful girl, and please take note of the fact that this scenario may not be well understood by people in the diaspora, but those in West Africa and Nigeria particularly will understand it better. And so, let's say the two men are A and B, and let's say man A gets his friend to go whisper to the lady or the girl that man B is impotent or HIV positive and it's a lie anyway but our interest is to show you the trick being played between the slave master and his slave hunting partners and so the lie rules man B out of the competition because the lady has no way of confirming whether what she had was true or not man B does not also know what she had remember the friend of man A had gone to find a way to whisper it to her, whether through another girl that is her friend or some other way, gets to feed her with that false information which she has no way of verifying. She can also go to the man concerned to ask him if he is HIV positive or if he is impotent. And man B does not also know what she had. Remember that very well motive while you know the motive of man a you may be wondering why his friend helped him to do that perhaps sentiments you can say or passion for mischief making then the friendship they share remains the key reason and also he wanted his friend to win the girl his friend may have done something like that for him in the past those are by the way our interest is for you to look at this scenario and see that it's akin to the trick being played by the slave master and his slave hunting partners and so when you see facebook youtube twitter bbc al jazeera voa cnn name it all against biafra and ambazonia do you not spend time to ask yourself how come they are against Ambazonia and Biafra the same way the African media are against the same group? Have you taken time to ask yourself where that synergy is coming from? Why do you think Europeans, Arabs, Americans will all take sides with another group in Africa to be killing others? Have you taken time to ask yourself why that could be happening? And like the analogy we gave you, have you wondered what motivates them? Either way, be it the ones in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Europeans, the Arabs and the Americans. Have you wondered what could be behind what they are doing? And so, if they had nothing they are gaining, why would they support one group against another? Have you taken time to ask that question? Remember the quote we cited at the beginning of this? video that said the negro was a proscribed race have you asked yourself who proscribed them when you see people condemning killings by the police in the united states for example 
do you not wonder why the same people are usually silent over killings in West Africa? Do you not also wonder where those that shout we are all Africans disappear to when there are mass killings in West Africa for example? What about those that call themselves Pan-Africanists and such nonsense alike? Why do they remain quiet too? Do you not sit back to ask yourself why an entire group of people, let's say the entire Africa, will be somewhere, there will be war, they won't talk about it until somebody from Europe or America calls them to a meeting to talk about a conflict or a war that is going on in their family or behind their houses or in their immediate compound or whatever you may choose to call the Africa they claim is Pan-Africanism or whatever rubbish they come up with. Have you taken time to examine the attitude of such men from such places as in West and Central Africa where a war will be going on, a conflict will be going on, they take sides with the Europeans, the Arabs, the Americans, not to report on it, not to talk about it, and then go for a meeting in Europe or America to talk about the same war, but they won't still do anything about it in their backyard. Have you wondered how such people can be classified as humans in the first place? And so, the only reason the slave hunters and the slave master will be on the same side against who they claim are their brothers and their fellow Africans and their fellow black people would be one, mutual benefit, two, absence of brotherhood. What would be the slave master's motive if we asked? Shared interest? Is it exploitation? Is it feudalism, eugenics? or the food chain pyramid. If you remember your food chain in your biology class where they teach you about the prey and the predator, you normally would see that in that feudal triangle, they will claim that the prey are usually more in number and tell you how it is a balance of nature, trying to use it to explain why there were more Negroes than other people and that made them slaves to the rest of the world. You don't need to believe us, you just need to go read them up yourself. And so, before we move into our topic of today proper, let us reference The Descent of Man, Selection in Relation to Sex by Charles Darwin, and this was published 1896, and here we are told that the American Aborigines, Negroes and Europeans are as different from each other in mind as any three races that can be named. Yet I was incessantly struck whilst living with the Fijians on board the Beagle with the many little traits of character showing how similar their minds were to ours and so it was with a full-blooded Negro with whom I happened once to be intimate. Now, this will help you understand the quotes from David Walker about how they were as American as anyone else because their sweat and blood had gone into it. And this is also something that will help you understand that the aborigine narrative is a very big lie and it's distraction because it offers nothing to the Negroes if you looked at it. It doesn't make sense to say you are an indigenous. But then, there is nothing coming to it. Somebody is still enslaving and subjugating you in the same land. That should give us the understanding that the slave master is behind the aboriginal narrative. And please remember that this book was written by Charles Darwin, who they claim is behind their evolution lie. But then, in this video, which is a response video, we look at some comments and the techniques of the slave master and their slave hunting partners. Remember, in the beginning, we asked questions about their synergy. We asked questions about how they work together today and how they could have conducted their slave raids together. Remember, part of the motive behind our own videos is to change the narrative, to get the Negroes to use their brains instead of listening to what Master and his uh, slave hunting partners are saying. And so, this takes us to the comments from one of our followers who we are sure is a slave master's foot soldier or a descendant of the slave hunters working tenaciously to make sure that the narrative of how it could have been a cell is sustained and also to distract us as much as possible and drive us to make the subject 
to be the Igbos or anyone else instead of the real slave hunters. Remember, part of their remit is to make sure they divert the discussion to where the subject matter will just be the victims of whoever they are targeting. Remember, if you don't talk about the slave hunters enough, it will be difficult to actually ascertain who could have been behind it. So they try very hard to make sure that you talk about someone else instead of them. And so we see from Mr. himself alone, let's look at it from the standpoint of chronology. Remember, when they lie, they don't factor in all the parameters. For example, he forgets that if there are 400 people in this community and you raid that community and capture 20 or 30 or 100, then there will no longer be 400 people there. And if you continue that over 400 years, everybody there will finish. But they don't factor in the depopulation side of the narrative. That's one thing that gives him away. But like we told you, part of what he's trying to do is to one, to distract us and two, to make us to be talking about this. He has been on this since he came on this channel. That's all he does. But he claims to be African-American, which we know he's not. And so he goes on to say, James Greenwood, the novelist, 1864. He was the first person I've come across to claim water was colored red, and then the priest sold people. As far as that essay you read about the people going and going through tunnels, make it clear, or rather, I will make it very clear that I'm not the author. Now, we know he lifted it from somewhere. We don't need to read everything he wrote. He said it was in 1864 that James Greenwood wrote that water turned to red and all that. But this is a lie, which you all know if you have been following this channel. The first person that wrote that was Dr. Becky, which we shall see shortly. But let's just finish his comments. He goes on here to say, at the Renaissance, no one ever said the Arrow or the Abam or any other Cross River tribe went to Bonche Island or Badagri or Elmina, etc., to capture people. The Arrow sphere of influence never went that far. Did Kalon Joko, who claims to have found the slave routes to Calabar and Boni, say anything about Bonche Island? Did John Origi say it? You want your listeners to ignore two Igbo PhD holders. Along with the current keeper of Ibino Babi, who says the same thing about the water being turned red as Dr. Njoko and James Greenwood. Please bear in mind that this person here is all working to make sure that he sustains the narrative that it was a cell. Whereas it was a hunt, a raid and a capture because at that time, the Negroes were not considered human. And remember also, they have to protect their slave hunters, which is the army you see today. Think about it. Do you genuinely, at your level as an adult, believe that the slave master could have created arbitrary boundaries, let's say like Nigeria, like Cameroon, and then create a bunch of lunatics and murderers, give them uniforms, and said, you, you are now called an army, and you are supposed to be protecting this arbitrary boundary that I have created from the, the same army you call Nigerian army and then the Nigerian army is also supposedly doing the same against the Cameroonian army and against the Gabonese army and against the Togolese army. If you think that makes sense to you, please put it in the comment section so that you understand the trick they are playing. The slave master and his slave hunting partners are still on their game and that's what you see them doing because look at it from any way you like. It doesn't make sense to believe that something like the Nigerian army is protecting Nigerians from the Cameroonian army, which is also protecting Cameroonians from the Nigerian army. Those things make no sense. But those were the slave hunters. They had to remodel them, rejig them in order to use them for what they are using them for today. And the simplest and easiest way to decipher what they are doing and to understand who could have been behind the slave raids is to look at Biafra and Ambazonia today and you see how united they are with their slave hunting partners. Think about it. How can somebody who riots or demonstrates over a killing of one man in the United States, he calls a black man, tries to give the impression that that black man is his brother, but keeps quiet when hundreds of his same people are massacred in a country where he is supposedly in control of. You will see women 
demonstrating naked in a place like Nigeria, the same people that were demonstrating and quarreling over one Judge Floyd that was murdered in the US keep quiet and pretend not to see. You don't ask yourself that question. And so he goes on to say, at the Renaissance, those one or two simply revealed what had been going on for who knows how long. Please take note of this statement and ask yourself how the slave master who had been buying millions of people from Europe to the Middle East to Americas to the Caribbean to Cuba to Brazil does not know where he was buying them from. Remember, like we told you, they lack humanity, they lack common sense. That's why you notice that in West Africa, for example, you can't debate, you can't argue back and forth with them. The only understanding they have is to kill you. That's the only thing you know they do. And the slave master understands this. And so from his comment here, he's trying to tell us that they were selling the slaves. Nobody knew it was them. But yet the slaves were being bought by some people with ships carrying as much as 700, 600, 500 men, women and children. But he's telling us that no, they didn't know who it was. But somebody was coming to buy it from them. They were so foolish that they didn't know who they were buying them from. Nobody can tell you one name of those Arab priests today. Nobody can tell you one name. Whereas we know that Sir Francis Drake was a slave hunter. Sir John Hawkins was a slave hunter. But you notice how smart he plays. He doesn't ever talk about the European or Arab slave hunters. He is talking about a tiny arrow of a population of less than a thousand at that time without ships, without horses, without firearms. He see how he is also now tweaking it to a so-called album. But yet there is no single record of where these people he is calling conducted a slave raid. And he goes on to say, when the victims entered, they never came back. They were believed to be dead. Now ask this man, how do children get there? That's the question. Is he telling us that only men were being sold? That's one question you notice that he has avoided so far. How do children get there to the slave ships since only men go there? He is trying to tell us that the Abams were the ones capturing the children. Tell us how. Explain where you read them from since you were not alive then. He cannot. And he goes on to say, because they were sold, no one ever saw them again. Please remember that this is a lie that makes no sense. Think about it. A man goes there and disappears. He is sold. Sold to who? Where is the man that he was sold to? He wants to tell us that the priests will travel three days because a man came to Arrow and then go to Bonnie or Calabar that was a day or two away to sell one man and then they come back again and wait for another man to come and that's how they fill a slave ship that takes 400 people. Even if they claim it was the Abams, the Abams they had no horses, they had no camels, they had no bicycles. How did they walk around? to go and sell people in Boni or Calabar. Remember, there is no way they could have taken the people to Arrow first and then start going to Boni or Calabar. Our interest is to expose their lies to you. We know one thing about them. They lack humanity. They lack common sense. Remember, we mentioned to you that if you wanted to understand anything about COVID-19, don't waste your time looking at the slave master. Look at his slave hunting partners. They will give the game away. Apart from the ones they have done in the past, ask those traveling to Nigeria to see what is going on there. You see how the slave master created a system that allows his slave hunting partners to make money from the victims of their slave raids. You don't need to believe us, we shall explain that in a subsequent video. And he goes on here to say, when the British decided to no longer take Igbo, rather to stop other Europeans from doing so, the rules was revealed. Now, the slave trade started circa 1434. He is telling us that it was by 1900 when the British took over the area and along with the Nigerian army, which was the slave hunters at that time, raided the arrow in 1901-1902, was when they now exposed what was happening. Meanwhile, the same British were the biggest slave merchants. So how does he balance it? He's now telling us that the British were so foolish that they didn't know who they were buying the slaves from until they came to Arrow. Think about it. The same people buying the slaves, like we always tell you, they lack humanity, they lack common sense. All you need to do 
to break down whatever they are saying to first principles it collapses he is telling us that the same british buying the slaves the same british that won the asiento contract from spain to supply negro slaves to the americas didn't know where they were getting the slaves from the slaves were just coming from thin air it's only when they came to arrow in 1901-1902 that they now found where they were buying the slaves from. You see how their lies collapse the moment you apply common sense to it. And so please don't misconstrue this as our trying to convince him. You can never convince them. That thing they believe, no matter how stupid it appears, that's what they're gonna stick to. That's how the slave master uses them as well. If the slave master wants to say that the Negroes had four legs before he came, or they used to walk on four legs before he came, he will just go and tell them, they will believe it and start propagating it and nothing you can do on earth will make them change and going on here he says generations of priests must have been taught the same technique now ask this person if you have 400 people in a place or in an area can you get four million people from there the answer will be no so how does he handle the population that comes with it and is he trying to tell us that the Igbos were so foolish that they were still going to arrow as people go there and disappear remember these are things they made up like we told you they lack humanity they lack common sense you see here he is also still defending the slave masters the actual culprits that captured and sold the slaves and then he goes on to say missionaries had been spending time with the Igbo since the 1800s now remember as we told you the Igbos refer to all the slaves from the birth of Biafra and Benin so when he's talking Igbo here, he is now talking what they have now conspired to claim is Igbo, which is the southeastern part of Nigeria today. If you doubt what we're saying, look at the BBC, look at the British, and wherever they talk about Biafra, you will see that they will try to tell you it's only a tiny portion because it's part of their conquest strategy, which they are championing through their slave hunting partners. You don't need to believe us, you just need to see it play out. And then he goes on to say at renaissance so with missionaries in the area studying the people they had a chance to learn about who they are hired now ask yourself how come he is avoiding talking about those that actually bought the slaves those that the slaves were taken or captured and sold to those who owned the ships the slave ships like jesus the slave ships like Jehovah, the slave ships like African, the slave ships like Vigilante, the slave ships like Diana and so on and so forth. He doesn't talk about them. He is talking about a tiny arrow that is not even up to a thousand people. The priests are not up to 20 in number. You see how subtle they play. But then we shall use his comments to show you who they are. And he goes on to say, Basden spent years in Iboland. He learned about the mercenary activities of the Abam. Dr. John Origi is repeating in part what Basden said. Charles Partridge, who wrote in 1905, mentions mercenaries, but not by name. And we asked him again, at Mr. himself alone, how does a man going to Aro become 400 men, women, and children in Bonche Island, Boni Calaba, and Badagri slave barracoons of the British? He replied, at the renaissance, stop asking me that irrelevant question. I've told you repeatedly, Arrow had nothing to do with those other places or those other types of Negroes. We are only dealing with the Igbo and neighboring tribes. Now remember, part of the remit is to sustain the lie that it was a sale. But think about it. How can you sell another man? The man will just stand there. You bring his wife and his children and say, I'm selling you. They talk about kidnap. You can't send an illiterate that has never handled a gun before to go and capture people for you. It's impossible. But they are now trying to tell us that the Negroes who were supposedly pagans, were illiterate, had no language, lived on trees, had guns with which they captured themselves. Remember, this is a global conspiracy. They are doing it together. That's why you notice from his comments, he is not criticizing the slave master in any way. He is not criticizing his slave hunting partners. He is targeting the arrow, but he claims to be African-American. If he was a genuine African-American so-called, how does he know he is not an Igbo or any other tribe he chooses that is a Negro tribe? He takes sides 
with the slave master and his slave hunting partners against one group trying to tell us that it could have been the negroes that did it themselves you see how smart they try to play and so considering the missionary he claimed lived within the Igbos, which according to the man he said he lived amongst them let us reference niger Igbos, a description of the primitive life customs and animistic beliefs etc of the Igbo people of Nigeria by one who for 35 years enjoyed the privilege of their intimate confidence and friendship, G.T. Basden, and this was first published in 1938, but we have the 1966 version, and here we are told that the eating of the vulture, Udene, is forbidden in most places. One reason given is that the people placed food for the use of the local god and a vulture flew down and ate it. A man was angry at this and retaliated by killing the vulture. Shortly afterwards, he died. His relatives consulted the Dibia to ascertain the reason for his death and the reply was that it was because the man had killed the Osu, slave of the deity. Since then, the people have not killed or eaten the flesh of a vulture and it must not be interfered with when consuming food offered to the god. Now, this story, if you looked at it very well, doesn't actually make sense. He says, a man was angry at this and retaliated by killing the vulture. And the same man died shortly afterwards. And when they visited a divya to find out what killed him, they said it was because he killed an osu. Did he kill the osu before killing the vulture or he killed the vulture after killing the osu? Which one is the correct narrative here? But our interest is further down where it says, at other places, the flesh of the vulture was not prohibited and it was not despised as food. So he's trying to tell us here that some parts of Igbo were eating vultures. Please take very good note of what he's writing here. Remember, this Mr. himself alone is telling us that the missionaries stayed within the people and understood what was going on. These same missionaries are coming from where the slaves were being sold, coming from the owners of the slave ships, coming from the actual buyers of the slaves, coming from those that were behind the slave raids, but they didn't find out who they were capturing the slaves from or how they were capturing them. It's only when they come to live within the people that they could have known how they were capturing them. We want you to take note of these circumstances very well. But then, if you know any part of Igbo that you have ever had were eating vultures, please put it in the comment section. Our interest is to show you how they work together. You see how he's quoting them as if it wasn't incumbent upon the slave master that was buying the slaves to tell us who he was buying the slaves from until he came to live within them. Ask him if they were selling the slaves to the British, to the Americans, to the Arabs, and then they don't know who they were buying them from. Does this really make sense to you? Then we see that the book was endorsed by some Igbos and this says forward by the right reverend A.C. Onyabo. I have carefully gone through these chapters and I'm greatly astonished with the immense amount of material that Dr. Basden had been able to collect and the accuracy of the information obtained on many important subjects connected with the customs of our Igbo people. So please take note of the fact that they saw the slave master as innocently coming to find out information. They didn't know he had ulterior motives. Remember, most of what they wrote are lies. They knew what they were doing. Materials have been collected from different parts of the country and what is set down either reveals a generally prevailing principle in the practice and customs or is a record of observation in one particular part. Attempts have been made from time to time by enthusiastic Igbo natives to write something on the history of the country, but every effort has failed, on the ground that none was able to travel widely enough to obtain full and first-hand information, but the, these descendants of the slave hunters want you to believe that the Abans traveled from place to place and we are capturing slaves. Remember one thing they don't factor in is the depopulation part of slave hunting. If you had 100 people in a place and you come and capture everybody, you won't capture people from the same area tomorrow. 
that's one thing they keep forgetting and that's one thing that gives him away totally but the only thing is that they understand that the negro may not think about those things when you lie to him and that's what he's playing on this difficulty dr Bazden has been able to overcome and he is himself an indefatigable scholar his missionary spirit and friendly disposition have drawn him so close to the natives that doors of guarded shrines have been thrown open to him and information freely given of secrets which have been held sacred for ages. To appreciate the great effort, one simply needs to study the introduction. I am sure that every Igbo reader will be deeply grateful for what Dr. Basden has accomplished and this was in Ebu Oweri by A.C. Onyabo in 1938. Now, the reason he has these forwards written by some Igbos is to add some level of credibility to the account contained in the book. So when you read it, you will say, because an Igbo person is saying they are true, then they have to be true. It's the same thing and the same trick that you see the descendants of the slave hunters play. You see how somebody who claims to be a so-called African-American is hell-bent to say it could have been the Negroes that sold themselves instead of outsiders that actually did it. So when you look at it, you say, oh, they say they did it themselves. That's ideally what he's trying to make everyone believe, which doesn't make sense if you were to look at it. But please take note of the fact that the forward says, I have carefully gone through these chapters and I'm greatly astonished with the immense amount of material that Dr. Basden has been able to collect. Now remember in the place they claimed some areas eight vulture. This man that is given this forward may never have been in those areas so he wouldn't know. He may also not even know what was happening in the next village because the communities were close to themselves it's not everyone that traveled even though this descendants of the slave hunters want us to believe that some people were now capturing and selling people in their hundreds and the whole village didn't finish 